Good afternoon. The time is now 3.12. We will begin this session, which is called Laugh It Up, Changing Minds Through Comedy. The moderator is Dave Smith. At this time, will you please silence your cell phone and electronic devices? And if there is a Q&A session at the end, you'll see two microphones on the end. Be sure to speak into the mic directly so that the guests on the stage can hear you. Thank you. What's up, everybody? How are we doing? Freedom Fest! All right, so this is a, a panel about comedy and how it intersects with uh, politics and changing people's minds. And I got four uh, great, hilarious comedians with me. So let's welcome them all out, of course. Dave Rubin, uh, let me get it in order, correct? The great Dave Rubin, the great Lou Perez, the one and only Caitlin Bailey, I think, is next. And Julie Borowski. Oh, well, thank you guys so much. It's, uh, they, they put a comedy panel right after a debate about war, which is the way <laughs> it should work. What's the funniest thing about bombing innocent civilians? You're about to find out. All right, so I, uh, I'll, full disclosure, I found out about 30 seconds ago that I'm moderating this panel. <laughs> I knew I was on it, but I had no idea what, you know, I figured someone else would be, I was like, so who asked the questions? And they were like, you do. And I was like, well, I haven't thought of any. So, <laughs> Dave, Ruben, how does comedy <laughs> intersect with the multi-layered facets of a political climate like today's? That is a great question, Dave Smith. Well, first off, I just want to address one awkward thing in the room, which is that when I gave my speech earlier today, I was informed right when I got off stage that my fly was down the entire time. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, comedy, well, look, we, we live in such freaking messed up times. Everybody knows it, right? Like, we're just living in this ridiculously stupid time where we're in this odd revolution, everything else, and you know, the loosely quote Oscar Wilde, it's like, if you're gonna tell people the truth, you better be funny or they're gonna kill you. And, and that's kind of, one of the interesting things the last couple of years is watching, uh, we've talked about this, how stand-up comics, so many people who I used to love that were funny have just become sort of hysteric, awful wokesters and, and have given up uh, so much of irreverence and being edgy and, and that's, you know, political correctness basically is the death of comedy and we've watched comics become politically correct. Yeah, it's very interesting to me that I think pretty much, I'd say like 90% of the great comedians ever w would be cancelable by today's standards, which is like a weird thing to think of, that you couldn't have Eddie Murphy raw. And I mean, I guess Cosby's comedy would still work, but the other stuff he does <laughs> Nobody's perfect, some huge you know? problem yeah, yeah. all of a sudden. Yeah. Um, but the, but, so I agree with you on that. I do, what, one of the things that was on the, the list about, uh, it was uh, like, can comedy be used to change people's minds? And I will say the first thing I thought about that was you, uh, Julie, because I remember watching your videos back when I was first becoming a libertarian, and they, they were, not that it was like one video of yours changed my mind, but your kind of mocking of the conventional wisdom yeah. did help to solidify for me that you're like, yeah, that really is a silly thing to believe, uh, to believe rather. Mm -hmm. So I think you had a lot of success in changing people's minds using comedy. I did. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's really cool. Yeah, I love to use comedy. I love parody and satire because I think it like changes people's minds like, oh, I didn't think about it like that before. One of my most favorite things to do is terrible reasons to support something. Like I did a video why I support the minimum wage and people clicked on it like thinking that I was like dumb. And I went into like, I support the minimum wage because I'm antisocial and I want robots to take people's jobs away from them. <laughs> and then like liberals who are watching this are like, wait, wait, wait a minute, that's, that's terrible <laughs> reason to support the raising the minimum wage. So like people think like, oh, wait, instead of me just doing a video, here's what I think, who cares what I think? I want to make people laugh. Yeah, no, I, I like that. And, and I also think one of the one of the greatest things about doing comedy now is that really anybody can do it. Everybody has access 
to similar resources. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Julie can make a video with her iPhone, I can make a video with my iPhone, put it out there, and then suddenly you have an audience that you had no idea even, even existed. Mm -hmm. So while, while there is, you know, a lot of high profile uh, cancellations, there is also this just incredible decentralized uh, ability for anybody with a voice to, to get it out there that I think is really exciting. Yeah, also, but you know, cancel culture isn't new. Right. This is the thing that everyone's gotta like adjust. The thing is like, we had a free internet for like four years and we were like, this is incredible. Everyone can say whatever they want to. And now that's kind of been scaled back a little bit, but try being like an anti, uh, war activist during World War One, and tell me about cancel culture. Right. You get locked in a mental institution. Woodrow Wilson send the FBI after you. By the way, can we all agree Woodrow Wilson's the worst president in the history of the country? God, I love these people. Dave is going for the easy ones. On yeah. One. Just the e all right, <laughs> fine. Lincoln was bad too. Now how to? Whoa. Here we go. I'm sorry, you Republicans in the back. But oh, it's true. Oh, God, that's the clip of this thing that's going to go viral, them applauding. Uh, yeah, I, Caitlin, why was Abraham Lincoln on the wrong side of the Civil War? Look, speaking <laughs> as somebody who would rather be right than happy, uh, I got to say, you know, like Bill Cosby and Louis C.K. Are, are still touring. Um, and you were talking about censorship on the internet. I mean, I, I left comedy and brought the tools of stand-up to advocate for sex workers, right, which is a group that is actively criminalized, actively being hunted. We've, uh, you know, I think when, when Robert Kraft was arrested, it was like five different law enforcement agencies threw themselves press conferences calling themselves heroes for breaking up an anti-trafficking raid when really what they did was spend six months recording the world's most boring porn. So like, <laughs> I think it's important for us to, you know, put these things in perspective of like, Dave, I know that you have a lot of friends that take a lot of heat on the internet. You know, I'm sure that we, uh, everyone standing on this stage has a lot of haters, but you know, we do still live in a country where most of us are able to express ourselves, but like, people are actually being arrested for showing their bodies and engaging in something older than money. And, and also yeah. we live in a country where billionaires also have to pay for hand jobs. I know, is... right? That's, that's the real injustice. Yeah, there's still, no, there's still some fairness to the system. Um, but <laughs> Caitlin brought up something interesting. So I knew Louis C.K. was touring. Are you telling me Bill Cosby is yeah. touring and where can I get tickets? I, yeah. yeah. He, oh what, he's not a good comic now? Just cause they let him out. Is he really back to yeah, yeah, stand up? Yeah, he's already. He's been out for like two weeks. I'm telling you, there's something they just announced. I, I don't remember the name of it, but wow. like, yeah, he's out. But so. doesn't doesn't isn't there a little part of you that goes, I kind of want to see what he's doing on stage now. I'm very yeah, curious. Look, the dentist bit's still gonna be funny, <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh, my I'm mouth, that was the thing, and the you know. I think Bill Cosby. I'm is dribbling from my mouth. mouth. Gosh, he has really been canceled, and that's because he like raped a bunch of people, yes. right? Okay, but like, I, I kind of want to be canceled because I think I would get so many more followers. There it is. Like the whole Dr. Seuss thing, people are like, oh, Dr. Seuss canceled. Well, his books went like top on Amazon. Like, I want my books to go top on Amazon, so cancel me. Yeah. There is something. Well, I agree. I also think that sometimes I'll say, I think cancel culture becomes this kind of catch-all mm -hmm. phrase that encompasses a lot of different things that aren't all necessarily wrong. And look, the, the Dr. Seuss example, that was their company mm -hmm. that picked like three books that really were wildly offensive. Yeah. And we're like, we don't really want to sell these anymore. That was not some like activist led campaign. Right. to Now I'll tell you this, right? Like I was watching, so my, my, I got a two and a half year old daughter and she, she doesn't watch a lot of TV because I care about right. it, but only like 12, 13 hours a day. So, <laughs> but she likes like these, like, you got a little kid too, you know, like the, the Coco Melon and like, oh, this, it's like these computer yeah, yeah. generated things that to, to people my age, I'm like, this is so weird. And I was like, I'm going to put her in front of like the cartoons I grew up in because they're so great. And oh, I put on God. one episode of Tom and Jerry and like, 30 seconds in, I am so horrified. <laughs> like, I was like, every scene is just, how can you torture this cat? Like, I mean, literally, like, rip his skin off, poke his eyeballs, to, and electrocute him while you're down. And I was like, this is, like, really not good. And I will never ha let her watch this again. And the, the thing, what was the guy, what's the rapist skunk that they canceled? Pepe Le Pew. Pepe, Pepe Le yes. Pew. I know I want to be like rapist. I, well, rapist. it's like every scene is basically him just forcing himself on some not chick who doesn't want it. It's just maybe it's not that unreasonable to be like, ah, 
maybe this isn't the best thing to show little kids. Culture changes. I tried that with Barney. The purple dinosaur I used to watch in the mm -hmm. 90s with my son, and it was all about caring and sharing, caring, 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 sharing, share, 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 share right now. I was just like, no wonder my generation is full of communists. <laughs> dang dinosaur. Hey, sharing? How about private property rights, Barney? <laughs> <laughs> How about a just acquisition of property? Read some lock, Barney. <laughs> you know, your, your point about uh, that you want to be canceled because you'll get more fans is kind of interesting because I've been through it so many times at this point that every, like years ago when the New York Times would call me a white supremacist, I would get angry. I would, you know, obviously you want to defend yourself. I'm not a white supremacist. I do believe white people should have a separate country that's better than the other countries, but I'm not a, you know. Um, nice. But no phones in this room, right? I just not in the mood today. Um, but now, even just two or three weeks ago, the, the New York Times, Mara Gay, the woman, uh, you know, this one over at the New York Times, real, real wizard, this one, she basically implied... Oh, yes, I do. She, yeah, yeah. she was doing an interview with Andrew Yang, and she basically said, you know, why do you do Dave Rubin's show? He's a white supremacist. And it was like, it was fun to me. Now it actually seems fun. Like, they've just gone so over the top. It's like, yes, I am a white supremacist. I want white people to reign supreme yeah. okay well, there's there's a it, it, like i was saying there's there's these differences within the kind of cancel culture thing i think that's important to note and i also think it's important to to note that cancel culture was far worse in the past and then like what caitlin was talking about we have something that is also way worse than than uh cancel culture which is nonviolent victimless yes. activities <laughs> being criminalized now people literally i mean we have the biggest prison population in the world yes. uh huge portion of them in there for things that they absolutely, talking about drug charges, yeah. gun charges, per, uh, sex work, I mean, I don't know what percentage of the prison population is sex work, but whoever, whoever's in there for it shouldn't be. And that is, is truly evil on a whole different level. But I do know that there is now, that the, the fact of the matter is that corporate America has embraced wokeism. And in the most shallow nonsense level of it, and the truth is that edgy comedians uh, simply are not going to be working corporate jobs in the same way that they could in the past. Now, personally to me, I don't really care because I think those corporate jobs kind of suck and that's not really what I want to do anyway, but I have seen a lot of people lose opportunities, mm -hmm. lose real money for jokes that they made that are deemed offensive. And I do think that that is legitimately dangerous because there is a purpose that the gestures serve mm -hmm. in mocking the ruling elite. That's like what we do at our best, is to get a crowd full of people laughing at how ridiculous uh, Joe Biden is or yeah. something like that. I think you're absolutely right, Dave, that I think, you know, the. the the tools of comedy make for, for great advocacy tools, right? And that contrarian streak that you were talking about, you know, sort of the giving the proverbial or literal middle finger to people that think that you should sit down and shut up is something that comedians and at the, uh, activists share. You know, and I think that's one of the things that makes us effective communicators because if you can make people laugh, you can make people listen. Now I will say that like, you know, the history of corporate gigs, there have been a lot of people that haven't been allowed to have those jobs for a long time for a lot of dumb reasons. Sure, I, I, sure, I, but I don't know if it was because they were offensive or they said a joke that just went against the grain of the standard orthodoxy of what is allowed. The truth is that comedians for a long time, and I say this as like a kid, a, a 90s child, were given license mm -hmm. in a way that I don't think they are anymore. Yeah, I think that something happened too. One of the, the great things about technology is that so many people can take part. And I think one of the bad things about technology is like if you go on, if you go on Twitter right now, there are uh, professional comedians out there trying material, putting jokes out. And then there are people like Phil in accounting putting jokes out as well. And this weird thing happens where because Phil is in accounting, he, his jokes are now getting judged by HR but then somehow yes. that, that blurs over into now comedians are being judged by HR departments. Yes. And it's like, whoa, 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 hold on a second, hold on a second. I don't work for your company. This is what, I'm doing something uh, different here. And I'm re I really wanna get to a point where those lines are not as blurry in that it's like, okay, we're good with these jokes, you know, I, let I, me do my thing. I feel like you hit on the right 
problem because I, you know, I, not everything, everything isn't for everyone, right? Every comedian has the ability to build their own brand, right? When you do edgy humor, you're taking a risk, you know, you're sort of building your own following and, you know, not, not every gig is appropriate for every performer and that's up to the decider on that. But I think you're absolutely right that we are now living in a culture where people that are not stand-up comedians, people that are not edgelords are posting things on Twitter or Facebook and suddenly it becomes, you know, some company's responsibility to police uh, the, the brand of their company through what people are doing on their personal social media. And that's a huge danger for the freedom of expression across the board. Oh man, I'm so glad I didn't have a smartphone and social media when I was like 20. Yeah. <laughs> Because man, would I be canceled already by now if anyone had a track record of I wrote outside. poetry in high school. <laughs> Thank God that's yeah, not yeah. out there. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna, you should be canceled for that. That's the lamest thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Julie, where do you come down on all this? Do you care? Is it just not, it doesn't matter to you? I mean, I'm a stay-at-home mom. I can say whatever I want. <laughs> <laughs> you can't get canceled <laughs> from that gig. Right? Um, I'm just telling jokes on Twitter from my couch. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it is a concern though. I think it's important as an individual to try to protect yourself because it happens. I know there's a lot of people who have anime profile pictures on Twitter because they don't want their employer to know. It's sad they have to do that, but you kind of have to protect yourself. Yeah. I mean, well, the general idea of this whole thing, I mean, you know, Tucker Carlson is not a comedian as far as I know, but Tucker uh, walked into my house where, when I had my studio in my garage and he opened up the door. Now Tucker makes probably 10, 12 million dollars a year. He's the number one cable news host in the history of television. And he opened the door to my garage and this is the exact quote he said to me. He goes, holy fucking shit, Dave, you did it right. Because I'm uncancelable. I do my show from my garage, I, I own the tech, and they're not gonna take me out. And he's, he has to deal with every day, he has to deal with, uh-oh, you know, uh, uh, this company bailed on me, so I gotta go back to Mike Lindell and sell some more pillows. Yeah. That guy sells a lot of pillows, by the way. Lindell is very happy. I he's mean, he's moving a ton of pillows because that's the only commercial on his show. And, and it's, it's working. Number one show. And if you just watch it, it's literally the whole thing. It's just Tucker gives his little monologue and then 16 yeah. MyPillow commercials. Yeah, he, he, I, I had him on the show once and he told me he loves it when they try to cancel Hannity or Tucker or one of those guys. He's like, it's great, they cancel them, they call me up, I throw more ads, I make more pillows, I sell more pillows, I have more money. Like, he's, the guy's happy as hell. It is, I will say, with the, the Tucker Carlson thing to me is a very interesting uh, situation and it's something that's made made me think a lot about how like markets work that if you had just told me on paper that here's a guy who has the number one show in cable news okay but there's a lot of activists who want him canceled but his audience is the number one audience biggest audience and you had said will he have trouble finding sponsors I would have said on paper no chance he has trouble finding sponsors because what corporations care about is what making money and they're driven by profits, and he's got the biggest audience. So, but he can't get sponsors. And so there is something very interesting about that dynamic, where even though he's the biggest audience, the corporations are, they feel, I, I still think they are about making money, but they feel that it's riskier overall to their brand to advertise on his show than not. It's, a, it's an interesting lesson about how powerful culture mm -hmm. it can kind of shape markets in a way that I think a lot of libertarians and free market types would have trouble dealing with. I'll, I'll tell you, one of the things that it made me re-question was the, the libertarian dogma about uh, the Jim Crow South and how if we had just had free markets there, don't worry, this would have solved the whole problem and all of these businesses would have eventually integrated because that's where the, the, the money would be. And you're like, I don't know. Never underestimate social pressure, outrage, and hate. Yeah. They can keep things going for quite a long well, time. Well, just, just look at what we're seeing where you have so many people with fuck you money who refuse to say fuck you to the powers that be. Mm -hmm. You have LeBron James who refuses to say fuck you to China. You have John Cena who refuses to say fuck you to China. And like um, John Cena's a guy, had he done that, you know, I never watched him wrestle, but I would probably become a wrestling fan. Right? So it's this really weird thing that's happening where you think like, oh, when manuel Miranda, this dude's got all the money in the world. He, he's going to be, you know, the, I, I, they're going to be iconoclasts. They're going to be willing to go against, the, go against the tide. No, 
It's not, it's not happening. I mean, well, it, it goes beyond uh, China, though. I mean, think about with lockdowns. Like, where are all of our comedian friends or, or actor friends, Hollywood people, that have no problem pontificating on literally everything and telling everyone how to live their lives when it comes to lockdowns, when it comes to masks? Comes, I mean, who, who really is out there on that? I know uh, Eric Clapton said that he won't uh, do concerts if they force them to wear masks. It's like, all right, that's pretty good. That was pretty that's cool pretty good. of him, yeah. Yeah. He said he will not perform in front of um, discriminated audiences, uh, which, yeah, I thought, I thought that was a pretty cool stance of him to take. Yeah, I thought also just, I, you know, there wasn't, like at first during the lockdowns, there wasn't that much stand-up comedy happening. But then as it started kind of happening, I, I was actually encouraged by seeing a lot of stand-up comics. I know, maybe not famous comics, but just making fun of the absurdity of all of it. Because it, it was so It's ridiculous. very mockable. And like, again, my heart breaks for every major pers media personality being asked to do things differently. But I really think the real problem is, is people that are losing their jobs because they have only fans, right? People who are being pushed off of platforms. Like, there is a real censorship problem in this country. And I don't think it's the, the problems that Tucker Carlson is facing. And we do live in a country where we can uh, say that it's ridiculous, that it's a federal uh, violation of federal law to remove your mask on an airplane, and also, would you like a cup of coffee? Well, Tucker Carlson's OnlyFans is just pillows <laughs> all over the place. <laughs> Mike Lindell's pillows all over. OnlyFans? <laughs> no, I haven't. I have an OnlyFans. Yeah? It's really changing people's minds. <laughs> um, I made an OnlyFans. I'm reading the Constitution, um, article <laughs> for article. Um, yeah, I, I wear it in a bikini. Except, like, I'm wearing a shirt underneath, and I have goggles on and sun tan lotion on my nose. I look stupid, but it's it's working. It's really changing people's minds. <laughs> I have another one where I have like Julie petting her emoji kitty, and I'm reading Article Two of the Constitution, petting my cat. It's working. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say I don't think like I don't think the role of comedy is ever to really change someone's mind. I think the role of, of like really good comedy, even like the best political comedy, is to like nudge someone at, like, like give them a little nudge yeah. to maybe reconsider, like, like just a little something that'll sit with them for a while. Plant a seed. Yes, I, I do think that's the way to put it though, really. Like I think it's like you, if you can make a good enough joke that gets someone just to crack up laughing about how absurd something is, you've left them with a little something that yeah. might gnaw away at them and then like serious thinkers might be able to get them to change their mind later. But your role is to just kind of nudge them with something. Like if you can get, and this is what, what drove me crazy and I think was about all the, the like woke comics you're talking about who hated Donald Trump so much. Like I would see all, like, like Amy Schumer on stage and like all these different like Hollywood comics like were just so angry about Donald Trump. And they would just get up there and just be like, it would be like, oh, do you support Donald Trump? Why, because he's so stupid and racist and evil. And you're like, listen, you're a comedian. You don't like Donald Trump. Isn't it so obvious what your job is here? <laughs> get the room laughing at Donald Trump, who by the way, is literally a cartoon character. Yes. I mean, like, he is the color of a cartoon character, his hair. Like, if you ever watch Donald Trump on, on television, there's, like, a bunch of humans, and then Donald Trump right. comes into yeah. the strip. Like, how easy is it? It's, you get the Donald Trump laughing. looks like uh, if he ever accidentally made a woman wet, he'd be like, ew, slimy. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm just saying, like, that's your task. So let them, like, let, but it's almost like they abandon the process of comedy because they were so angry about the situation. And to me, I don't, you just look at it, you go, well, that's never gonna achieve what you want. Now what you're gonna get is a whole bunch of people in the reverse being like, oh, like, well, screw you. Well, it shows you, it shows you how wokeism basically destroys everything. I mean, look, The Simpsons, which for those you know, prime years, say seasons like four to nine, it's like comedy perfection. It's exactly what you're saying comedy should be. It's nudging people in the right way. They were saying something edgy, and then what's happened to The Simpsons? Well, not only did they go woke, but Hank Azaria, who is the greatest voiceover actor probably in the last 30 years, maybe Harry Shearer is better, who's on the show with him, he's no longer doing Apu because they decided that was offensive. Apu, who was the hardest working guy in the show, who you learned about Hinduism and veganism from and was totally welcomed in as a friend. There's an episode, I mean, the, the Who Needs the Quickie Mart episode, they do a whole episode where Homer's anti-immigration, but then because of Apu becomes for immigration. Yeah. And now Apu Hank Azaria- He was maybe the best person. Yeah, in the show. he was probably the most morally redeemed character in the show. And now uh, Hank Azaria will no longer do the voice of Apu. However, he's not returning the money. 
Well, the, so that the, makes the thing that was, well, of course, the thing that was so ridiculous about that one was that it's just like, look, the Simpsons were like, I mean, the butt of every joke was who? It was Homer. The butt of every yeah. joke was making fun of the suburban white father. And so they made fun of like everyone, but that, like, we're gonna just complain. Look, to me as a comic, I go, that's almost like the most like, the, the, the equality is that nobody's off limits or a sacred cow, like we can make fun of everyone together. So I agree with you, I thought that one was stupid, but I don't, I think it's not just wokeism, I think any type of dogma mm -hmm. doesn't mix with humor. Because once you have dogma and you're not allowed to like step outside of that, it's impossible to be funny. I, th yeah, I, think, I think that there's something like, all of us who've been on stage, especially with an audience, we, we don't know anybody in the audience, and then you say something and you make that audience laugh, you just did something pretty amazing. You took complete silence and then turned yep. it into laughter. And for, for me, in do, doing comedy, I'm still amazed by that, and I'm amazed by the people that I used to watch. But it seems like today, where especially with the people who believe that the personal is political, it's like, that can't be enough. Mm -hmm. Doing your trade and doing it well can't be enough. I ha it has to. I have to encompass everything, everything about my politics, about my being. Gravity itself has to be there with me. And I feel like that's really getting in the way of people. And then you start seeing, you know, uh, you know quote unquote, activist comedians. You know, it's like, like you know, putting that, uh, that slash in the, oh, excuse me, excuse me. Yeah, I don't think comedy is always about changing people's minds. Sometimes it's about connecting with people and building a community. Uh, I know Dave Smith has extremely loyal fan base mm -hmm. on Twitter. Don't come at me on Twitter. Oh my gosh. You don't want none. I made like a neutral comment one time and like I got <laughs> attacked. Like, oh my gosh, people say I have white knights. No. <laughs> <laughs> Never cross my army of loyal simps. They will. <laughs> As you were saying about gestures. I had to call them off of Julie. I was like, she's cool, stop. I mean, you know, contrarians take risks, you know. Gestures were executed by kings that were unhappy with what they had to say. I do think it's the role of, of comedians and, and people out there to ask people to think differently about something, you know. And uh, I've got to say, it's not the woke police that are committing raids across the country arresting people for the horrible crime of making people feel good for money. Yeah, well, listen, I mean, we got, there, there's no question, I mean, I just think of them it, to some degree in separate categories, but yeah, the militarization of the police and SWAT raids and everything like that is a major problem in this country. There is uh, pockets of, and after the COVID, not so much pockets of, legit totalitarianism in this country that most of us don't speak about. And when we have an event like this, you know, celebrating freedom, maybe it's not the worst idea to like pay attention to that a little bit because that is legitimately, you know, something that if society survives, we will look back on as like the most primitive, evil, barbaric thing imaginable. I, I will say that I think so much of the problem of all of this stuff is just politics. And from my perspective as a libertarian, I don't think it's a coincidence that as the government, which has gotten so, so extraordinarily much bigger in just my lifetime, okay. whether the, the tremendous expansion of government in the George W. Bush mm -hmm. uh, administration. Then Obama took that and expanded every inch of it further. Trump, whether you like it or not, took that and expanded it further. And now what Joe Biden is proposing is literally like some Zimbabwe level craziness. And is, is it really a surprise that as the government gets bigger and bigger and bigger, everything in life becomes more and more hyper political? Mm -hmm. And you know, when you think about it, right, there are such profound differences that people have. Like, you will have right now in this audience, you have like a Christian sitting next to an atheist. The most profound difference in belief, like one person believes that the person next to them is going to burn in a pit of hell forever. And that atheist looks over at you and believes you are delusional. <laughs> but you're fine. Like, you're not going to war, because it's, it's separated from politics. Right. Now, if tomorrow there was going to be a vote over whether the government is Christian or atheist, those people start going to war. 
because they're warring over who control, who rules over you. And so the problem with all of this, with comedy and with everything else online, it's not that we have differences, it's that we have political differences. Politics is poison. And that's why, the, the, that's why you want to reduce the size of government and let people be free, because then we don't need to go to war. It doesn't matter. We could have a million different, like who really cares if there's like someone wants to raise their family in like a traditional conservative Christian you know, house and someone else wants to like, I don't know, do naked yoga in their front lawn, like, all right, keep it on your property. <laughs> um, do you guys want to add something? We could go to questions if you guys want to, or do you, does anyone else want to say anything before we go to I questions? I was just gonna say, I think we need more comedy in the Liberty community because if I go on Twitter and Facebook, I'm just sad, I'm anxious. All these libertarians talk about the world's gonna end tomorrow, economic collapse is around the corner, World War III is gonna happen. It's, it's really like, gets my heart racing. So I think comedy is addressing those serious issues in a way that pe makes people laugh and feel okay about themselves and not have to go to a therapist because of all the things they see online like I did. Amen. <laughs> Amen, Julie. Jeremy Todd, what's up, my brother? What's up, brother? All right. So you guys mentioned nudging, and we, we then, then that went on to a, a path about dogmas and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing, and that really resonated with me about uh, I think one of the people most responsible for taking me on, starting me on my libertarian journey, and it shocks people, is John Stewart uh, in the Tonight Show, or not the Tonight Show, the Daily Show, right? Mm -hmm. how, so first question, how in the hell has it gone so bad on programs like the Daily Show? Where, and, and can we ever return to that sort of John Stewart spirit? Uh, and then my second question uh, is, did you guys do a, a quick training on how to handle hecklers on the internet? Oh, well, I just call them a bunch of words you're not allowed to say here. <laughs> Can I tell you, listen, this is my honest opinion. You know what it would take for Jon Stewart level great daily show comedy again is a Republican president who starts two stupid wars. That's when it's okay for the left to be really good and funny, and that's the reason why they were so great during the George W. Bush years. Yeah. And I'm sure there's some Republicans here who would disagree with me, but you're wrong and I'm right. And <laughs> it's, impo it's really important for you to understand that. And it's really important to understand, right, this is my big message to right-wingers, and I wanna say this as gently as possible. This is all your fault. <laughs> Everything that's happening now is all your fault if you supported George W. Bush and Dick Cheney because they ruined the 21st century for the world. And I am not overstating that at all. They ruined everything. And in this tragic irony, like a, a Greek tragedy, right? The right-wingers who supported George W. Bush creating the war on terror have now found that the targets of the war on terror is, wait for it, right-wingers. You guys are the domestic terrorists th that the whole apparatus that you supported creating is yeah. now focused on. And it's so tragic, it's, it's awful, but you know, I mean, I can't feel that bad for you because there were like five million Muslims who got killed during that whole thing while you guys were cheering for it. And I'm just saying, supporting that is what, is what ruined everything. So basically, right, the left was great under George H, uh, excuse me, under George W. Bush, because they made fun of how ridiculous the Patriot Act was, and the, they went against the dogma, so they were hilarious. Right. And then Obama came in and expanded all of it, and it broke the left, yeah. because the left had to choose between all of these principles that I had here and not supporting the first black president. And the, it, the, the identity of the left, for fair reasons, is so wrapped up in being not racist. And that's, that's understandable given the country's history, you know? Like, they, they don't want to be the racist one. And it just hurts so much to not support this charismatic, black, first black president of the United States of America. So they went all in on him, completely betrayed all of their values, and embraced the dogma. And now they can't be funny anymore. And that's what you see with Trevor Noah and all those guys. They can't be funny because they've just embraced the dogma. That's it. Yeah, yeah it's... Uh... When, um, when John Stewart left, I was reading a lot of uh, articles that was talking about how you know, he was willing to speak truth to power, you know, sp speak truth to power and, and on and on. And I think one of the things that the people who speak truth to power sometimes forget 
is that they're the ones in power. So it's sort of like, are they gonna have sort of this monologue in the mirror? And I think sometimes, well, that's what you have to do. You know, so much of comedy is about, you know, holding up a mirror to society. Mm -hmm. But I think it's really important to turn that mirror around every once in a while and say, whoa, yeah. what are we doing? How, what hypocrisy do we have in our, uh, in our lives? And the good thing about being a, a libertarian is that every four years, we're not gonna be happy. So, you know, we're always punching up, baby. Or shooting up, I forget what the... I think the Colbert Report was so genius in the way that you oh, satire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so I, this was back in high school, college, where I was still clinging a little bit to my neocon tendencies, and I'd watch the Colbert Report and be like, man, is that how stupid I sound? <laughs> so it was kind of like looking at a mirror and be like, wow, this is, my ideas are kind of stupid. That kind of introduced me to libertarianism. Um, as far as haters, you have to let your haters be your motivators um, because... <laughs> I didn't get a lot of haters when I started because nobody cared who I was or what I said. And as I got more popular, I got more haters because they cared. Haters care about you, and I think that you should appreciate that. Yeah. I, I completely unironically agree with that. I've gotten way more haters as I've gotten a bigger yep. and bigger following. And it is, it's just kind of an indication that it's like you matter more. I don't know. Good. What's up, brother? I made sure I checked my fly before I got up here, Dave. To <laughs> you checked your what? My fly, Dave. Check oh, your fly. Yeah, there you go. Fly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fly was down. I think everyone likes to think that they're funny, but outside of the six of us, I don't know if anyone <laughs> is naturally funny. That's good. So That's good. Pretty good. For the for the normal people here who don't want to be professional comedians, but who might want to just get better at injecting humor into what they're doing, can you learn to be funnier, or is that just a a God-given gift that, that you, that we all have. I think you gotta just say something true and then hopefully something funny will come out every now and again. Like that really, to me that's it. Like I did stand up in New York for about 12 years. Like I lived that life. I lived, it was before YouTube, thank God. And like <laughs> I did that whole thing. And, and now it's weird because now I'm popular for other reasons so I can sell out clubs and I, I have like two jokes. But I could just kind of go up there and talk to you guys and, you know, it's like sort of with the late night question that you just asked, it's like what they also have to kind of do is just not be so crazily partisan. Like, does anyone make fun of Biden? Biden is Mr. Magoo. Like, Biden, the president has dementia. Like, that's funny. It's scary, but it's funny. <laughs> Mostly scary, but, like, there's something there, right? But, like, have any of these guys, Colbert or Fallon or who else are the late night guys? The guy on NBC nobody watches and the other guy? Kimmel. Uh, Kimmel, blackface Kimmel, he's funny. And, uh, no, who's the other guy? Uh, Seth something. Myers. Seth, Seth Myers. Myers. Yeah. It's like they're, they've all shown you what they are, so now they're just constantly protecting that thing. And it's like maybe you need less writers and just go up there and kind of be yourself. I think that's part of it. And, and I would just say also that um, John Stewart, particularly, who was just so great at doing The Daily Show. I mean, he was so funny at it. He was ruthless with the Democrats. Yep. I mean, he was not like a guy up there who was like, oh, I'm going to be defending my side constantly. I mean, he was like vicious. And again, the, I'm sure a lot of you guys, but I think literally what I will it forever be indebted to Jon Stewart for was that brilliant piece on Ron Paul that he did that was just the greatest thing ever. The greatest thing ever. And he did not do that because he agreed with Ron Paul's politics. Like, he's not one of us, but he just thought this was so funny and ridiculous. And, and he was, like, led by th that. Like, he was led by that. That was his North Star. It wasn't like saying what is, what is approved. It was going for what's funny, what's real, all of that. And as far I don't think, I don't know if you can become funnier, but you could definitely get... Like, I don't know if you could become funny, but you can definitely get funnier. So be around funny people. Watch a lot of funny stuff. Weed helps, too. <laughs> Enormously. Heavy doses. Yeah. <laughs> What's up, brother? Dave, Dave Rubin. Uh, you guys have been awesome the last year. Uh, seriously, Dave, uh, I've shared your stuff with Tulsi Hawaiian uh, guys who've absolutely loved your stuff, um, Trump lovers, and... Now they're listening to the part of the problem talking about free market stuff, which I never thought was going to happen. Uh, but my question, comedy obviously works, but I'm from New Jersey. I go out in New York a lot. 
I'll be sitting at a brunch, listening to my friends ranting the most crazy stuff, and it's not like I'm gonna airdrop a Joe Rogan episode to them and be like, listen to this guy, he might have better <laughs> ideas for you. But, so, in those situations, what do you do? I'm not gonna sit there and be like, guys, you're wrong about healthcare, <laughs> like in the middle of a brunch. Uh, and after the fact, I'm not gonna send a Joe Rogan episode to everybody, so, in those real life scenarios, what, what do you think is the best way to play that? Get better friends. <laughs> That's probably, yeah. That's not, that's not, not bad. Libertarians in Boy, <laughs> you almost have to like, you gotta figure out when you're talking to people, right? Like there's different categories that people fall into, right? And there are some people who are really, like if, they're, if they disagree with you, they're in the realm of having a logical debate with you. And if they're in that realm, then great. You can use logic with them and try to do your best to show what you think the flaw in their logic is and why your logic is superior. But there's a whole other group of people that far outnumber, unfortunately, that group of people who that's really not what they're in it for. And I see this happen a lot with like libertarian free market types where you will be, it's like you're using logic as this weapon against like uh, some, some left winger or right winger or whatever, you know, and, and using this logic as a weapon. and. That's just not what they're battling over. And so you point out to them, like you're like, aha, there's a logical inconsistency in what you just said. And you think you've got them because you would lose sleep at night if someone pointed this out in your worldview. Like you'd be like, oh my God, I'm like contradicting myself. I have to figure this out. But they don't care about that because they're playing a different game. And a lot of those people, it's not about the logic of their views, it's about what role in the world their views offer them. Mm -hmm. I am now champion anti-racist who gets to go on the hunt against all the white supremacists. Well, you might find a logical flaw in that and be like, hey, you know, it's not that racist of a country. At, but what does that offer them? All you did was just demote them from champion to nobody. So why would they want to embrace that? So in a weird way, you have to, and I don't know if I have the answer to that, but you have to find a way to offer them a position here in camp logic. That's a cool position to be in. And I don't know if I have the answer to that, but a lot of times it's very difficult. And this is not just true for left-wingers. There's right-wingers who fall into this as well. But there are, there are people who it's like, they're just not, they're not going to be swayed by logic. Well, for one, I just think it's amazing that you're actually having brunch with people and having conversations. Just like in general, like that seems like an old world thing where so, like, because I, I've noticed, I mean, when so many relationships have moved online to Facebook, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the reality is that, you know, the point of a Facebook argument isn't to win, it's just to waste the other person's time, <laughs> right? So at some point when you're with this person, you really have to say, think like, is this worth it? You know, is this, it, I, I hope there are other th aspects of this person that you enjoy other things that, that, that you can do, um, because you know, ultimately you're gonna you know, have to ask yourself that question. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Ma'am? Hi, uh, this is for Mr. Rubin, and I'm just curious how much longer you're gonna continue to lower your standard by being a guest on the Greg Geltfeld show. <laughs> um, That's, that is offensive to me that she didn't even feel like I was lowering my standards <laughs> yeah. going on the show. Dave, wait, wait, does that mean your standards, standards are higher? Or wait, Dave Smith, that's just about right for you. Yeah, that, um, <laughs> that's I, funny. I'll tell you, I, I love Gutfeld and the, you know, talking about like the late night thing, you know, these guys, uh, you know, all the guys we just mentioned, Colbert and Kimmel, these guys, they have, I don't know, 20, 30 writers that make them look that level funny, like not very funny, right? And just pandering and awful. Gutfeld has, I think, one writer and then he has like two cameramen and like somebody that maybe does makeup. He has virtually no crew. They have no budget, no nothing. It's three You've of them. You've done it. He gets it's, up there. It's three of them yeah. that do it. It's Greg Gutfeld, and he's got just two writers, but they're, they're hilarious writers. Is uh, Joe Mackey, who's like one of the oh, funniest yeah. stand-up comics in America, and Joe DeVito, who's hilarious. Yeah. So, but it's just the three of them, and they put the whole thing together. And they, they do that show on a shoestring budget, and he's crushing them right yeah. now in the ratings. It's so awesome, but that proves, yeah. That proves it's like, it's, it's kind of messy, it's gritty, it's a little more like Red Eye that he used to do, you know, like a decade ago. 
and it's just much more real and fun. And yeah, he stumbles over some stuff and he doesn't read perfectly off the prompter and all that, but that's what people like rather than just like this overly polished, just like pandering nonsense. Agreed, and can I just, just add quickly to that, that, and I think this is a fundamental difference between how I look at the right wing, because I really do think of myself as separate from left and right wing. Like I, I know people don't like that and think it's a cop out, but I really think libertarianism is Walter Block's the, the third leg on the stool. I think we're a different thing than left wingers or right wingers. We just believe in liberty, and that is not true really for left or right wingers. But I will say that my perception that I think differs tremendously from the left wing view is that I think uh, for the most part the right wing has gotten a lot better in America over the last 15 years, and they think it's gotten a lot worse and gone off the rails. But Greg Gutfeld, let me tell you something, I remember doing Greg Gutfeld's show like six, seven years ago, and it was him and Brett Stevens, and they were arguing with me forever about how we needed to bomb every Muslim country because we just had to bring freedom there, and I was such a stupid libertarian for thinking we could not bomb. And then I remember doing Greg Gutfeld's show post-Trump, and he goes, that we were talking about Meghan McCain had said this thing about how Donald Trump's family has brought so much suffering to the world. And Greg Gutfeld goes to me, the McCains? And I was like, better. This guy <laughs> is getting much better. And the truth is that whatever you say about Tucker Carlson, he is so much better than Bill O'Reilly was. And like, there's, I don't care, if you're, if you're opposing the national security state and the wars that have killed millions of Muslims, that's better than supporting it. So I, I like seeing the direction those guys are, are going in. But, uh, all right, we got two minutes left. So let's try to get this quick, which, okay, it's this side now. You go, sir. Hopefully this is quick. Um, while comedy is inherently against dogma, does dogma have a role in society? Yeah. Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah. I would say so. I would say there has to be some, Absolutely. at least like like limited dogma in society. Yeah, well otherwise what would your friends be talking about at lunch, right? <laughs> like that's it right there. Yeah. yeah, I mean I think there has to be some like restraints, but the idea of like in a free society is you want them to be as minimal as possible, right? So like yes, I do, I'm sure there has to be some type of social uh, dogma, but I'm probably not smart and enough they, to know. And they exactly. should hold, it should be able to hold up to scrutiny yep. and yeah. mockery. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good way to put it, yes. All right, sir, you're gonna bring us home. I'm bringing us home. In the 80s, early 80s, I had done some improv and been um, done a little stand-up, and there was a big trend where if you would swear, people would laugh. And it wasn't the construction of jokes and humor and, and the uh, surprise element, it was just they'd swear and people Wow. Fuck that. So, like, comedy now is attack political people, and there's no construction of humor. If you look at, you know, if you go back to Freud's book on, you know, uh, wit, it, it, it doesn't bring those elements to it. What are your thoughts? Um, I think that in anything, like this is probably something like the Pareto distribution, right? Like in any field, and comedy is included, the vast, vast majority of people are not impressive and they're not very good at what they do. This is true for journalists, politicians, comedians, like any field you can say, the vast majority of people are, they can get by. They're just not that good. But no matter what style of comedy it is, if you look at the elite, I think they're always very, very good at it. And that's true whether it's clean or dirty or anything in between. Yep. I don't know. Any other thoughts, guys? All right, that's it for us, everybody. A round of applause for Julie Borowski, Caitlin Bailey, Lou Perez, Dave Rubin. Thank you, guys. Thank you for coming to Freedom Fest.